While they were working, Esther grabbed my arm and looked at me with worried eyes. Are you sure this will work, Thomas? If you're wrong. I looked at her and suddenly I felt the same emotions I'd had back in high school when those bullies were attacking Jenny. This was what I believed in and I wasn't going to back down. This is the right thing to do, I said fiercely. I'm sure of it. She looked in my eyes for a moment and then said, I believe you. The next few hours were a blur. Some members of the team checked and double-checked the new antivirus, while others made arrangements to transmit the code to technicians on the ground in Israel. Those people, in turn, got set up to reinfect the Patriot systems and then test them to ensure the antivirus had taken. Meanwhile, as the clock moved closer to midnight in Tel Aviv, Esther and I spent the time in seemingly endless meetings with dozens of people, all of whom were highly skeptical of our plan. Finally, we wound up back in the director's office, where, after a long and sometimes heated debate, he looked at his counterparts in other branches of the government and said, Unless someone else is prepared to implement another solution in the next hour, let's stop talking and start taking action. It was obvious that the others weren't satisfied, but they really had no other options. After the meeting broke up, the director came over to Esther and me and said in a quiet voice, I hope you know what you're doing, for all our sakes. There wasn't anything I could say, so I simply nodded and the director seemed to accept that. He motioned to us. All right then, you two have ridden this horse this far. You deserve to see it through to the end. Come with me. With that he led us to the roof of the building, where a helicopter was waiting with its engines idling. We climbed on board and the bird immediately took off. I'd never ridden in a helicopter before and found it pretty unnerving, but Esther wasn't phased a bit. That reminded me again how little I knew about her. After a few minutes I looked out the window and spotted the unmistakable shape of our destination. The Pentagon. This was certainly a week full of firsts for me. I'd never been to the Pentagon before either. Soon enough we landed on one of the helipads and were immediately escorted deep into the inner rings of the command center of US military might. An armed guard was waiting beside a nondescript door, and when we approached he opened it and motioned us inside. The room we entered was a long rectangle. Most of the center was taken up by a large oval table. The seats were arranged to face a huge flat-screen monitor that filled the wall at the far end of the room. Seated at the table were more generals, admirals, and other high-ranking officials than I had ever seen in my life. Esther and I were shown to one of the chairs that lined the side walls. Across the room I spotted the director who'd ordered me to Oak Ridge. He quickly looked away when he saw me staring at him. After a few minutes, the lights were dimmed and everyone turned to face the giant flat screen. At first, the only light came from two time displays on the bottom of the screen. One showed Washington, D.C., the other Tel Aviv. Esther whispered anxiously, It's almost midnight in Israel. Suddenly, the big screen filled with a God's eye view of the earth, but I couldn't figure out what I was seeing. Then the screen blinked and suddenly the same view reappeared, this time with a normal north-south orientation. I could see a line of lights that seemed to outline the shores of an ocean, and there were clusters of lights from other cities as well. Then lines appeared on the screen marking national borders, and circles and names popped up around the major cities. I realized that I was looking down from a satellite at a nighttime view of the whole Middle East. Suddenly the screen zoomed in, then zoomed in further. Now all I could see was what appeared to be the lights of a small town in the desert with a highway running by it. The caption read Demona. Too close, a voice spoke up, and then it looked as though we were climbing through the atmosphere. Now I could see the coast of the Mediterranean in the northwest corner of the screen and a dark area toward the east. That's the Dead Sea, Esther whispered to me, pointing at the picture. A little further, please, the voice said, and suddenly we could see the whole of Israel and parts of its neighbors. All right, people, we're approaching zero hour, the disembodied voice said and suddenly Esther was gripping my hand very tightly. The screen might look like some sort of media presentation, but her anxiety reminded me that there were real people down there. Keep your eyes on the north and northeast, she whispered again. That's where we think the attack will come from. Syria and Iraq? I asked. She only nodded. The time display ticked off the seconds, and I noticed there wasn't a sound in the room. Finally, when the clock displayed 2400 hours, I heard a collective intake of breath, but nothing happened that we could see. The seconds ticked by, and I could hear whispered comments. 
I told you so. I heard someone say, and then Esther's nails bit into my hand. There, she said, pointing at a tiny orange-red arrow rising from the desert north of Israel. Then another and another blossomed. At first each one appeared almost to stand still, but then they began to arc over and fly south. More arrows lifted off from the northeast. Holy, someone exclaimed, those bastards really did it. There must be over two dozen of them. Probably Scud DS, another voice speculated. Now the flaming arrows were past Jerusalem and coursing over the Dead Sea. Someone had put a marker with a timer on Demona, and it was evident even to my untrained eye that it was the target. This was like watching a disaster in slow motion. I didn't want to watch it, I was mesmerized, unable to turn away. Suddenly, new flashes appeared all around Demona, and then there were new arrows of light rising into the air. Time seemed to a crawl and the oncoming arrows never wavered until I was sure that our antivirus had failed and the Patriots had missed. Then a large yellow blossom appeared in the night sky almost directly over Demona, and almost immediately the darkness was filled with fiery flowers that glowed and then seemed to flutter away. Then Esther flung her arms around me and was kissing me wildly. You did it. You did it, she cried. As I hugged her back I could hear cheering from the people in the room. Then a voice said, situation report from Demona. One missile got through. Esther jerked around and we both stared at the screen. Missile was apparently knocked off course and hit south of town. Only minor damage is being reported. There were more cheers. Suddenly I gasped for air and I realized I'd been holding my breath throughout the entire attack. But before I could say anything, the display showed a new series of launches only these originated from within the state of Israel. What's happening? I asked in confusion, but when I looked over, Esther was staring intently. Patriots are not the only missiles we have, she said, never looking away from the screen. Those are Delilah's ground launch cruise missiles carrying cluster munitions. Our radar will have tracked the path of every scud and calculated the reciprocal course. Now we return fire. She turned to me and her face had a wolfish look. You didn't think we would allow them to attack without retribution, did you? Even as I watched, the telltale lights were heading north and east. But this time, I realized there were no patriots to defend against the oncoming death. I did look away then. I sat quietly in my chair and watched the congratulatory hugs and handshakes around the room. Soon afterwards, Esther was called away to take a phone call, and then I really felt like the odd man out. After a while, an MP came looking for me. Sir, the NSA director is going to be here for a while. He's instructed me to offer you the services of the helicopter to take you and Ms. Freeman wherever you need to go. Esther returned just then, and the two of us followed our escort through the corridors and out to the helipad. I thought she'd be dancing with happiness, but she seemed somewhat subdued. When we climbed up into the helicopter, she leaned over to the pilot and asked, would it be possible for you to take me to Dulles International Airport? What's going on? I asked in surprise. You know we say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, she said with a grim look. The missile counterstrike you saw back there was the eye for an eye. Now I've been called back to be part of a tooth for a tooth. I'm catching the first plane to Tel Aviv tonight. Oh, I said glumly. I thought maybe. She smiled and squeezed my hand. I would have liked to celebrate as well, but we don't always get to decide such things. The helicopter covered the 25 miles to Dulles in very little time at all, and then Esther was leaving. She turned to me and took my hands in hers. You have surprised me in many ways, Thomas Selfridge. I will never forget you. Then she kissed me quickly and was gone before I could think of anything to say. I was in a strange mood on my way back to College Park. Now that everything was over, the events of the last week seemed unreal, like scenes from a movie that flickered through my memory. The places I'd been, the people I'd met, the things that I'd done, none of it felt quite real. Part of the problem, I knew, was the way my emotions had gone back and forth through the spectrum. It was like I'd been dreaming under anesthesia and was having a hard time shaking off the effects. But when I got home, I had to enter through the side door because there was a sheet of plywood nailed over my shattered front door. And the living room was just as disheveled as when I'd been there last. I guess it wasn't a dream, I told myself wryly. 
I managed to find something to eat in the refrigerator and then returned to the living room, where I righted an overturned chair and flopped down. Maybe it was just the adrenaline wearing off, but I began to feel depressed. I glanced at the clock and realized that it was almost midnight. Damn, the Christmas break was over and I had to be at work tomorrow. I wandered back to the bedroom and turned on the light. Everywhere around me were signs of Ginny. Photographs, her clothes, furniture that she'd picked out. I looked at the bed and couldn't help but wonder if she and Amir had ever. It was too much. I grabbed a blanket and went back to the living room to try to sleep on the couch.